never set out to find that proof, to identify the residue of one human in the excrement of another. But what kind of a test would prove that? It was a scientific challenge never before undertaken. So we had to find a protein that was only found in skeletal muscle, muscles of the legs or the arms, uh, and not found uh, in the gut. That protein was myoglobin. Human myoglobin could only show up in a person's feces one way, if he had consumed a human. Marler prepared his test with the utmost diligence. There could be no false positives for animal myoglobin or for other human proteins that might have entered the intestinal tract. Finally, after months of preparations, he was ready. Marler performed six sets of tests using small fragments of the coprolite, along with a series of different controls. Blue meant no human remains, but if any turned yellow, it would be irrefutable evidence of human consumption. Marler ran the tests in triplicate over several weeks, and time after time each test came back the same. Positive in the coprolite. Positive for human myoglobin. We did find um, myoglobin, human myoglobin, in the coprolite. We feel now that uh, it has entered the mouth and passed through the system. Consumption seems to have been proved, and cannibalism finally demonstrated beyond doubt. But questions remained. Why cannibalism? And who practiced it? Clues come from outside Chaco. Evidence points to numerous cannibal cultures throughout the Americas. Some go back 2,000 years. The practice also occurred in the South Pacific, and in New Guinea it continued well into the 20th century. From the 16th to the 18th centuries, Europeans practiced medicinal cannibalism, believing human blood and body parts cured disease. A recent find in Spain indicates human ancestors were eating each other some one million years ago. In the southwest of England, at Goff's Cave, an excavation from the 1980s led by anthropologist Chris Stringer revealed a pile of animal bones. But in the same trash heap were human bones. At the Natural History Museum in London, evolutionary anthropologist Peter Andrews and biopaleontologist Yolanda Fernando Yelvo began a year-long analysis of the remains including this human shoulder blade. These scrape marks, this, particularly this one coming down here, cuts right across all those cut marks. So the main evidences are the similar pattern between animals and humans. If you find all the human remains mixed with the animal remains, and they have the same pattern. And of course, with the animal bones, and the automatic assumption is that they were, what they were doing was butchering the animals to eat. So what we do is, is compare the damage on the animal bones with the damage done on the human bones. And if they're the same, then the obvious inference is that they were butchering the human bones to eat, just the same as they were doing to the animal bones. They subjected selected fragments to analysis using even more precise technology, the scanning electron microscope. It isn't always all that easy to see cut marks on bones. And so it's quite possible that there's a lot of evidence out there with collections already made and might well be uh, related to some, some form of cannibalism or butchery of some kind, that it just hasn't been observed yet. Wow, it's that's beautiful, That's huh? great, isn't it? Is that a cut there as well? Magnified a thousand times, the bone surface shows clear signs of markings from stone tools. The thing about this is that you can see very clearly that the scrape is cutting across these cuts. Here's a cut coming here, this cut's coming across here, but the scrape was after the cut. But then you'd expect that, the scrape should be after a cut. Yeah. Um, going through the marks right. left by these Stone Age nomadic hunter-gatherers are almost identical to those left by the ancestral Pueblans in the American Southwest. For some, the conclusion is obvious. Probably all populations, all races, all people, at some one stage or another, have, been, have practiced cannibalism.
then it's a very characteristic thing about being, being human. Are we prepared to accept that our ancestors were cannibals? As scientists suggest that cannibalism is a recurrent theme in human history, they are also providing theories that help explain its causes. Humans as a source of food is one of the strongest mechanisms at work here. The mix of human and animal bones points to hunger as a driving force. This is commonly known as survival cannibalism. Whether practiced by plane crash survivors or pioneers, this form of emergency cannibalism will likely never disappear. In 1846, members of the Donner Party, a wagon train of 87 destined for California, were stranded by a blizzard in the Sierra Nevadas. They were forced to endure one of the worst winters on record. Only about half lived to tell their tale of survival, and some admit to fending off starvation by practicing cannibalism. Could hunger have been the primary force leading to Turner's cannibalism? The Southwest has historically been a marginal land, water and food chronically scarce. But ice core samples and tree ring analysis from around the world show that the years 900 to 1150 were marked by a warming trend. In the Southwest, food may have been easier to cultivate, game easier to catch, a time of plenty. So survival cannibalism was probably not the driving mechanism here. But Harvard archaeologist Stephen LeBlanc, an expert on prehistoric warfare and violence in the American Southwest, pursued the possibility that food was the reason for cannibalism. He did some gruesome calculations. The average event seems to represent maybe five or seven people, but some of them seem to represent perhaps 30 people. And those are the ones that are hardest to explain. That the, the, the number of people that it would have taken to have consumed 30 individuals is really staggering, maybe two to 400 people. You try to com compute just how much meat would have been consumed in one of these events, it turns out to be hundreds of pounds of meat. So much meat, in fact, that those practicing cannibalism would have been wasting a valuable resource if they were going strictly after food. Another kind of cannibalism is related to worship and the reverence for the dead. Various cultures around the world, most notably in South America and the South Pacific, believe consuming portions of the dead helps keep their spirits alive. A symbolic form of this kind of worship is part of some Western religions as well. Turner's 30-year study included 15,000 skeletal remains. 500 showed signs of violent death. Another 300 were butchered and consumed. In all, one in 50 victims of cannibalism. Cases included men, women, and children. Since their bones were discarded like those of animals, indicating inhumane treatment of the dead, ancestral worship seems unlikely. Cannibalism is sometimes associated with warfare ritual consumption of the enemy dead. Stephen LeBlanc sees evidence of warfare and violence throughout the history of the ancient Southwest. And he argues that the evidence is found not just in the human remains, but in the kinds of buildings constructed and where they are built. Well, the walls are part of the defensive component of the site. That this community not only was sited on the top of this knoll, and, but they then built around the exterior walls that originally stood at least two stories high. Um, uh, probably a hundred people or so lived in this community. Everything that they had to eat, all the firewood that they needed, the water that they needed, all had to be hauled up this hill, up into this fortress. So they weren't up here because it was fun. They were up here because they had to be up here. This is a very unpleasant place to live, really. It's, it's windy in the spring. It's likely to get by, hit by lightning during the summer thunder showers. It's really a, a sort of a miserable place, actually. And most people in the world don't live on tops of mountains. And uh, so you sort of ask yourself, why are they up here? It just 
This doesn't seem to make any sense. Then when you go one step further and say, what's everyone else doing? And you look over there and you see that they're all on the tops of hills and that all the tops of the hills are intervisible with each other so that one can see each other. Then you begin to see an even larger pattern of this concern for defense. People were really being killed. There really were massacres. If you didn't build these, you died. But strangely, during the time when cannibalism reigned, things were different. You have this fairly long period of 800 to 1,000 years up to about 900 AD with sort of this chronic intermittent warfare. And then, just almost suddenly, it stops. Then you see this period of about 200, 250 years with virtually no warfare. But it's the time when we have this very anomalous treatment of people. 